First John this evening. First John, which actually isn't First John. Uh, I'm surprised all the new editions of the Bible don't straighten that out. Uh, you know, you'd think they'd get it right, but uh, they haven't bothered to mess with that one. You have the Gospel of John, then you have First, Second, and Third John later on. You'd think that if anything, first, second, third John would come first, and then later on would come the Gospel of John. But uh, I guess that's not a problem in the Greek, or at least in the minds of the people that correct the Bible. First John chapter one. Uh, I'm going to read from verse number five as John introduces this very short letter, uh, but very powerful, I think and certainly needful for us this evening. This, then, is the message which we have heard of Him, Him being the Lord Jesus Christ. Back up in verse 1 and 2. And declare unto you that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie. And do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. I want to speak to you tonight on the thought or the issue of undealt with sin. Undealt with sin. April the 15th is fast approaching. I normally, about this time of year, start getting depressed. <clears throat> I mean, you know, we begin to think of how much we spend to uh, finance what goes on in Washington. And uh, it's just unbelievable, unfathomable, the amount of money that exchanges hands on a daily basis. And it's even more... Uh, terrible when you consider that it's our money. Uh, Amen. I mean, I don't have any problem with rich people buying yachts or jet airplanes. Doesn't bother me in the slightest. The crowd I worry about, the crowd that takes my money and buys yachts and buys airplanes. Okay. Uh, I mean, I'll be honest with you. I think we have pinpointed the wrong enemy. It's not the rich guy. You say, well, he didn't work for that money. Neither does anybody in Washington. Not that I've ever seen or known. It's a cushy job. Now, that's enough said about that. But April the 15th, people start getting a little uneasy. Now, I'm going to let you in on a little secret tonight. If you don't pay your taxes by midnight on April the 15th, I think this year it's the 17th, 18th, 17th, okay, you're going to get in trouble. Okay, everybody, I'll, the IRS contacts me. I'm going to send them your way. You're in a world of hurt. But there's my perfect illustration. If you don't pay your taxes on April the 17th this year, on April the 18th, they're not going to kick in your door. Okay? You're not going to have guys in black uniforms, you know, rappelling off your roof, crashing through the windows, and dragging you off to jail. You understand that, don't you? It's not going to happen. As a matter of fact, Washington is so effective that if they do break into your house on April the 18th, it's probably because of some infraction seven years ago. They are just right on the money here with it. And, uh, you know, they're running a little behind themselves. Okay. And, uh, but we, we have that innate or that built in fear because we know it's something we don't like to do, something we dread doing. And there's always that worry. You know, I've had several guys tell me that the tax code, which now is about this thick, it's about eight or ten inches thick in volume form, single space, and I think three columns, that there are so many laws in there, they could get anybody. But not to worry, they usually have no idea what's going on. 
Uh, we got a kind letter this week from the IRS that sent us a check for, I think, $300 or something from uh, 2007 or 2008. They stopped in to let us know that as a church we hadn't filled out a form that was supposed to be filled out, and, and uh, we informed them that the law said we didn't have to fill it out. And after it was all said and done, they realized we were right, and they sent us money back. Uh, that's a wonderful thing. Amen? But I said I'll have to say this. Just because it doesn't happen on the 18th or the 19th or the 20th doesn't mean they're not going to come and there's not going to be an accounting. There may be a year that would elapse or two. And you may be cheating on your taxes. They'll get you. And may I say, they should. You say, I just thought, said you th- didn't like taxes. I don't. But if I have to pay mine, you ought to pay yours. Okay? We ought not to cheat. We ought not to pad. We ought to pay the government what we owe them. Thank you. That's what I was waiting on. This could be a slow night tonight. I think it's part of being a good citizen. Uh, You say, well, I don't like what's going on in my country. I suppose at any point in the history of this nation, you could have found a number of people who didn't like what was going on in our country. They would have been called Tories during the Revolutionary War, whose affinity laid with England. And, uh, but the truth of the matter is, overall, aren't you glad you live in America tonight? And I'll be honest with you, what we pay in taxes, whether we like what they do with it or not, is a small price to pay to live in the land of the free. And uh, there are people who would gladly pay what you and I pay yearly in taxes just to live here in this country. Now, having said that, you say, what has that got to do with sin? Very often we treat sin just about uh, like we would do taxes that we were trying to fudge on, get we think we're going to get away with it, see? And all at once, if we're not careful, the Lord doesn't blow up your house the day after your sin. And, uh, you know, it doesn't take sometimes a week, a day, or a month. And if we're not careful, we begin to assume that it doesn't matter. And so tonight I want to just spend a few minutes and talk to you about the danger of unconfessed or undealt with sin. Now, 1 John is an unusual epistle, and there are those who teach that nothing in 1 John is applicable to the believer. I disagree with that wholeheartedly. Uh, I think that uh, 1 John is applicable to the believer, perhaps not in every point doctrinally, but certainly strongly applicable in practical application, in telling us how we ought to live our lives as Christian people. And in this passage, he deals with the issue of sin. I know that there is a contingent today that has been birthed in a modern time who says that all sin is a side issue. Because Jesus died on the cross to pay for the sins of the world, that it is no longer an issue. You don't have to bring it up to God. Just go ahead and do whatever, because it's all covered under the blood. In some part, I agree with that. Let me tell you where. I agree with it in the sense that the condemnation of sin is forever removed when faith is put in Jesus Christ for redemption. I think that the issue of my sins will never face me again in the area of my eternal destiny. I stand tonight redeemed, forgiven of my sins, and on my way to heaven. Not because I don't sin. If getting into heaven is by abstaining from sin, you don't know anybody that's going to heaven. Nor did anybody you ever knew. (laughs) know anybody that's going to heaven. Anybody that would tell you that heaven is earned by some meritorious good work or abstinence from sinful thing, let me tell you something about them. I don't need to know. They have their own definition of sin. And it is not God's. The Bible says the thought of foolishness is sin. I got news for you. I don't suppose I've spent more than two minutes in my life without having a foolish thought. Some of us are handicapped that way. Amen. I mean, somebody said I'm crippled too high up for crutches. And uh, I don't listen. Just that one thought alone would condemn all of us. 
to the lake of fire. If heaven is earned by abstinence from sin and sinful things. As a matter of fact, the truth of the matter is that him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. That's the Bible. Now, that's not Baptist doctrine. That's good old-fashioned King James Bible. And whether you realize it or not, that applies to everybody. Methodists and Presbyterians and Episcopalians get in on this one. The Bible said if you know to do something that's good and fail to do it, it is vile, wretched wickedness. So here's what we do. We either invent our own list of what sin is or we say that, well, there's, see, there's one from column A and one from column B. We get the moral and venial thing going. How many of you remember that? Say, Moral and venial is a religious invention. It has no basis whatsoever in Scripture. The same Ten Commandments that said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and also said you're not supposed to bear false witness. And he didn't say anything about two kinds of lies, you know. Well, there's good lies and there's bad, less like there's good witches and bad witches. All that kind of stuff. We see we work it out in order to evade our own issues. We reinvent our religious belief structure to back up the way we live. And that's a dire mistake. The truth of the matter is, my sins were forgiven as a result of my putting my trust in Jesus Christ as my only hope of the forgiveness of my sins. I have no other means by which I can cleanse them. And so I stand tonight justified, that's the Bible word, just if I'd never sinned in the sight of a holy God. Why? That has nothing to say about my character. It has to do, say something about the character of the blood of Jesus Christ. I happen to believe it was perfect. It was so perfect that it cleanses every stain of sin away. And not only does it cleanse me once for all, but it keeps me cleansed. Over in the book of 2 Thessalonians, the last chapter, the last four or five verses, it says that he is going to preserve my body, soul, and spirit blameless. Not only did he wash my sins away, but he, God in heaven, promised. I mean, you know, God can't lie. If God lies, what happens? We're sunk. And the God who cannot lie has promised that he will be responsible for keeping my body, my soul, and my spirit blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, what does that mean? That means I don't ever have to worry about going to hell. You say, yeah, but what if? Wait a minute, you've already messed up. What if I what? There's nothing I can do. It's what if he? It's what if he? I'm not going to get to heaven and go, <laughs> I made it. <laughs> I'm going to get to heaven and say, Whew, I made it. That's the guy right there that paid for my sin debt. And so I believe this, that my sins have no effect whatsoever on my relationship with my Savior. I am His child. The Bible said, but as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. When I trusted Christ, I was birthed. We call it being born again. Birthed into His family, and I now am a child of God. And that is forever. I have said on numerous occasions that I was born many years ago to my mother and father. They had no guarantee I would be a good son. As a matter of fact, they accepted me as their child because I was their child biologically. And there's nothing that can undo that. If I were to become a mass murderer on the scale that would defy any historical precedent whatsoever, if I were to become the worst of the worst, if I were to become the most lousy person that ever lived, so much so that my parents would shy away and deny that they even knew who I was, I would still be their child. The genetics will tell you that. And there is within my spiritual being tonight the genetics of my heavenly Father. And He cannot deny me. I am His. You say, well, I believe. Well, that's fine. 
I believe if you don't live the life, don't talk the talk, don't walk the walk, it's just not going to happen. I just don't believe and help yourself. Because if that's true, you just damned yourself to an eternity without Christ because I guarantee you I could find some loopholes in your life. And I'm not God. The truth of the matter is it's all by grace or it's not at all. You get to heaven, it's going to be through His mercy, or you're not going to get there. Now, having said that, there is nothing that can affect my relationship with my Savior. I am His child. But there is something that can affect my fellowship. How many of you understand that if you have parents who love you and they are your parents, they will always be your parents no matter what kind of person you are. But at the same time, those parents might be embarrassed to own you as their child. They might say, oh, no, that's, that's, that's his mother's son. Amen. Uh, she, he got that from his mom's side of the family. Did you ever say something like that? You know, Some of you ladies probably didn't say it that. You said he got that from his father. That's where that bullheadedness came from. I know. It's his father, you know. Uh, but we like to blame that. We can be set aside from that fellowship that is there because of our sins. And John, I believe, is addressing that issue as we deal with it here. He said several things that you and I need to take note of if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie. Sin will keep me from having that close relationship and fellowship with my Heavenly Father. I am still a son, but I am a son at distance. I am still a child, but I am a child that is displeasing to its father. I am a child that is kept at arm's length from that affection that very often a father wants to Give If you've ever had a child and had to punish a child, I'll tell you, sometimes we punish a child by saying, nope, daddy's not going to hold you. Mommy's not going to hug you. You say, oh, that's wrong to withhold affection. Hey, whatever it takes to get a child to live right is okay. Okay. You say, well, I'll help yourself, you know, raise the wrecks. I appreciate that. But sometimes a child has to learn that affection comes oftentimes from complicity to establish rules and parameters. It's good to live the right kind of life. You say, well, I want people to love me just like I am. Nobody will love you just like you are. You stink. That's why God gave you the ability to change. You say, well, this is the way God made me. Listen, He made you as a little baby about that big. You've changed drastically since then. He gave you the ability to grow, to learn, to change. So do it. Change what you are into what you ought to be so people will like you and love you. Don't become the victim. You know, well, you know, I'm just the way I am. Well, then go sit on a stump and vegetate. Because you're not going to make me love you because I feel guilty. I'm more capable of loving you because I feel sorry for you than I am because I feel guilty. You say, well, I think you're obnoxious. That's just the way God made me. You're just going to have to love me the way I am. It is my fellowship that is at risk when I allow sin into my life. I believe that we ought to confess our sins. Somebody says, well, John's not applicable to the the Gentile believer. Well, if it's not, then certainly the book of Romans must be. Let me tell you what Paul had to say about sin. Romans chapter 8 says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. Romans 12.21 says, Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Romans 13.12 says, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not pro- 
provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Galatians chapter 5 verse 16 says this, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. These are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that you would. And they that are Christ, verse 24 says, have crucified the flesh with the affections and the lusts. How many of you kind of get the idea God wants us to live right? Colossians chapter 3 verse 5 says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things, or for which sake, things sake, excuse me, the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them, but now ye also put off all these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication, communication out of your mind. Don't tell me that James is the only one that deals with this issue. The Apostle Paul boldly dictates to us again and again, don't do this, don't do that, do this, do that. That's what God wants. The idea that somehow being a Christian absolves me from any responsibility to right living is absurd. If something was a sin in the days of Noah, it is a sin today. God doesn't change. That's one thing we know about Him. The same yesterday, today, and forever. And if something was a violation of His holiness when Cain killed Abel, then it's a violation of His holiness today. You say, well, yeah, what about the dietary laws in the Old Testament? You've got to be careful when you read your Old Testament. There are two phrases you need to familiarize yourself with. One of them there says, this shall be an abomination unto you. You say, well, what does that mean? That means you look at this like it is an abomination. Then there's another phrase, this is an abomination unto me. How many of you realize if I said to you tonight, this shall be an abomination to you, I haven't told you what I think about it. I'm just giving you good counsel on how to conduct your life. But if I say this is an abomination to me, I don't care how you feel about it. I've told you how I feel about it. You might ought to consider your Old Testament at that You say, well, you think that Old Testament is binding? Not for my relationship as a son, but for my fellowship with my father, yes. For my fellowship with my father. My father used to assign me every once in a while chores. He would say, son, listen. A garage needs to be cleaned out. I want the garage cleaned out by Saturday afternoon, and that's what I want you to do. I want you to cut the grass. I want you to clean it. And he would assign me those chores. And listen, my father loves me. I have no doubt of it at all. My father loves me. But there were certain times when I would say, hey, Dad, listen, uh, some of the guys are going to do this. Would it be all right if I went? And you know what he said? Absolutely not. You know why? Because he hated me. No, he loved me. You know why? I had not fulfilled his desires in the area of what he wanted me to do. I didn't clean the garage or I didn't cut the grass. Had nothing to do with my relation. He was still my father. I knew that because if I said, well, if you want me to go, too bad. I'm not your son. I'm going. I would have woke up in the hospital three days later and it would have been his name on the hospital bill. That would have been paying it. Uh, He was my father. But you see, that closeness could have been affected. And some of the opportunities and options I had as his son could have gone away because of that strained relationship. Having said that, there's a warning here in John about not dealing with our sins. What a wonderful thought that says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's a wonderful verse, but it's not only applicable when we come to Christ as our Savior, it's applicable to our fellowship as well. I always knew when I had gone over the limit, pressed pressed the envelope, as it were, as my dad's son, I always knew that all I needed to do was come back and tell him I was sorry, that I messed it up. And sometimes he would divvy some punishment, never what was merited. (laughs) But that relationship and that closeness would be restored. All I had to do to restore that closeness was to ask. And I have learned much. I believe it's important to have a good father when you grow up. I don't know that we all have them or that we all are them. 
But it's important to fulfill that role as a father because we teach our children more about God than any other relationship they have in life. And if you're a man sitting here tonight, let me encourage you to be the man God wants you to be because your kids are not just learning about you, they're learning about God. And they'll learn it from you. But I could go and say, Dad, listen, I know I didn't clean out the garage. I know that. And I messed up. And, and Dad, uh, I understand I didn't get it done. And, but I'm going to go out and do it right now. Will that be all right? He would always say, no, I told you to do it yesterday, but it would be all right. Go do it now. It would restore that fellowship that I was missing in my life. But the sad thing is, for the most part, we don't do anything at all with our sin. Uh, we may, the most spiritual thing we may do with our sin is to say, oops, oops, and we think somehow that takes care of it. But it strains that fellowship. And we need to know that that sin needs to be taken care of and addressed. It cannot be allowed to lay in our life, and it will not lay dormant. And that's what I want to talk to you about. Psalm 66, verse 18, David said, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. That's a strained relationship. Do you ever have a parent so angry with him, you call them on the phone and they hang up? I don't remember too many occasions. I think my father may have been mad enough at me once or twice to say, I'm not going to talk about this right now. And I got the message. <laughs> Click, you know, we'll talk later. Why? Because there was a strain on that fellowship. And he didn't want to deal in anger. So he waited. And there are times that if I don't deal with this issue of sin, there may be a postponement in God's working in my heart and in my life. What does it mean to leave sin and its effect in my life? What will result of that? It affects not my relationship. I want you to write that down. I don't want you to get confused about that. Sin does not affect my relationship, but it does affect my fellowship with my Father. What does that mean? That means if you sin, you're still a son of God. So I just believe you lose it. Then you've lost it. Okay? I've been down that theological nightmare before, and it's a road that doesn't have any end, and it doesn't lead anywhere. But it does affect your fellowship. Sin not dealt with. Write these things down. Number one, sin not dealt with remains a barrier. You understand, I can forget about it as time goes on. Did you ever do something you knew you weren't supposed to do, but you went ahead anyway, and you thought, well, you know, and after the fact, you know, the roof didn't cave in, the building didn't explode, and so you said, well, you know, it must not have been that big a deal, and so you let it go, and you let it go, and you let it go, and eventually you just forgot about it. God didn't. God didn't. You and I may forget, but He does not forget and that sin remains even after it is forgotten. You see, we think we've been absolved from our sin because it's been removed from our conscience. But I remind you that your conscience can be strengthened or weakened by what's in the Scripture. As a matter of fact, it's possible to have a conscience that's been seared with a hot iron. It is totally non-functioning. And so if I come to that place, then I must think every sin is all right because I don't feel bad about it at all. That's dangerous. Sin undealt with remains a barrier in my fellowship with God. Now, I'm addressing 21st century Christians living in a modern age with contemporary Christianity, and his relationship with us really isn't all that exciting. <laughs> uh, we have totally distorted and changed the idea. I think Brother Gipp said it well. Every instance in this book about a father and his son or God and his relationship with you does not tell you how God failed and how he needs to spend more quality time with you and he just hasn't been the father he ought to be and how he needs to change and be a better father. There's nothing in here about God being a better father. You want a relationship with God, you do what he told you. And we have distorted and eroded the complete concept of being a man and being a father. And our society will suffer for it. You say, well, you know, my dad, he just worked all the time. Who put food on the table for you, kid? Well, you think he ought to just stay home and collect welfare so he can spend quality time with you in the backyard? Get a life. 
Life's about working. It's about labor. It's about doing hard things. It's about doing those. You say, well, you know, my father should have been. Maybe you ought to be a better son. Everything in this book tells me how to be a good son and how to approach my father. Every time you say, I want a relationship with God in heaven, I'll tell you what you need to do. That's what the book's about. And I'm not saying there's no such animal as a man that ought not to have been a father. I've met some. But I'll be honest with you, very often, very often, we get to this place where it's all dad's fault. And you see, we're, we're the victim generation. We're just looking for somebody to blame it on. Well, I am the way I am, you know, because my dad, he just, you know, when I was little, when I was three, I wanted to go to the game. He wouldn't take me to the game and... It just distorted my whole, oh, you're nuts. You want a right relationship? Have one. How's that? The wonderful thing about being a moron is you can stop anytime you want. It remains a barrier to that fellowship with God. But not only that, it strains my relationship. It's a barrier to the relationship I have with other Christians. I have people every once in a while, and I can tell they're disgusted. Some of you are disgusted tonight. Can I tell you why? Because I'm knocking on your door. Turning your gods over. Well, preacher, I just don't believe that it's as bad as you say. That's because you're up to your neck in it. Nobody likes to hear the preacher talking about gambling when they're playing poker tonight after church. Nobody likes to hear the preacher talk about playing the lottery when they think they're going to win it this time. Nobody likes to hear the preacher talking about drinking when they fell out of the car last night when they got home. It puts a barrier there. And the people that I ought to be close to and the people that I ought to want to be close to, I can't be close to when those sins remain in my life undealt with. It'll strain your marriage relationship. Those things need to be dealt with. If they're not, they will put a barrier there between you and whoever it might be. But particularly among the people of God. You want to know why people quit coming to church? They just can't take the pressure. They can't live the duality of being something on Sunday and being something entirely different on Monday. They can't handle that. They can't come around clean people when they're dirty because they're afraid someone will see the dirt. And that unconfessed sin, undealt with sin in your life will be a barrier in your fellowship with God, but a barrier in your fellowship with other believers. You say, well, you know, I, they're just goody two-shoes. I told you, you know why people say that? Because they're goody two-shoes. Which means they live a better life than I do. And I don't like that. I want everybody to be dirty like me. And if they're not, I don't want to be around them. And so I'll just quit going to church, and I'll tell you why. It's because they just didn't reach out to me. They were just judging me all the time. Truth of the matter, nobody ever stood up and said, you're a dirty, no good sinner. Nobody said that in church. You just felt that way. And I'll tell you why you felt that way. Because you are. But if you had dealt with the sin, you wouldn't have to worry about that. Rather than deal with the sin, I back away and I back away and this thing becomes a barrier in my fellowship with my Heavenly Father. People say, well, you know, I read the Bible. It just doesn't say anything to me. Can I tell you why? God's not going to take time to talk to you. You say, well, I don't understand why. Because of the junk you got covered up in your room. <laughs> The junk you got covered up in your mind. The junk you got covered up in your actions. The junk you got covered up in your deed. I mean, you're not going to deal with it. God's not going to fellowship with you. And neither would Christians. I've knocked on several doors in my life and I've heard people say, you know, just a minute. And five minutes later, they open the door. There's this mad dash, you know, the preacher's here. Get it off the table. Clean it out. Move it. Get it out of the You know, hide it in the closet. Listen, I've got news for you. If you change anything when the preacher comes, it's not anything. It's not the preacher's intimidating presence. 
It's the fact that somehow down deep in that vile, wretched heart of yours, you know there's something wrong and it bothers you. Just like it would bother me. I'm no different. You say, well, I can't believe, guess who I ran into, the preacher. Oh, I can't. I got news for you. I'm not the intimidating presence of God. You just were forced to confront what was already in your life that you wouldn't deal with. You say, well, you know, you made me uncomfortable. Why? I'm a pretty friendly guy. I talk to people every once in a while. God's my witness. I don't even know. And they know all about me. My wife and I on several occasions have had a conversation with people, and we've walked away, and I've said, who was that? And she said, I have no idea. I said, they were right friendly, wasn't they? I don't remember. I mean, listen, I have people, you know, I knew you 20 years ago. Well, good. I probably knew you then, too, but I don't know you anymore. Listen, if somebody makes you feel intimidated or uncomfortable about something in your life, it's not them, it's you. Somehow it's not dealing with that sin that builds those barriers. It builds a barrier to spiritual ease. I'm always dealing with the guilt if I don't deal with the sin. It's always there. Always there. Every time the devil wants to banter me, he's got the ammunition. Do you ever have the devil open up your closet of secret things and drag everything out right in front of you? And beat you over the head with it? About the time you say, thank you God, I was able to serve you today. The devil goes, I just need to remind you of this and this and this and this. And you go, oh brother. You know why you have to deal with a dirty conscience, or a guilty conscience, I should say? Because you've got a dirty mind. Something wrong. You haven't got cleansed with the Lord yet. Don't allow the sin to remain undealt with in your lives. Why? Because it builds a barrier. Let me say, secondly, don't allow the sin to remain in your life because it retains the ties that need to be broken. It retains the ties that need to be broken. I don't suppose there's anybody that got saved and was a Christian very long that didn't lose some friends. Uh, Listen, you're going to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. If you've been running around with friends who were lost and unsaved and you begin telling them you got saved, they're going to think you're a religious fanatic, a weirdo, a a crackpot, you know. Can't believe it. You know, you're going, you're in a cult. And all at once, you're going to have some friends that just don't want to hang around you like they used to. And I'll tell you why that happens. That happens because they don't want to remain tied to you because you make them feel guilty. But the truth of the matter is, when I don't deal with that sin, it keeps me tied, first of all, to the world. keeps me tied to the world. You know, the Bible tells me to love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. And I understand there's, there's wiggle room there. We're in the world, and, and sometimes it's a fine line to determine where I step over the line. But the truth of the matter simply is this. When the world has a hold on me, when the world beckons me and I can't go, and it frustrates me, then it shows me there's some ties that ought not to be there. I like getting on people about the Super Bowl. I like getting on people about all kinds of things. And listen, we all like to watch sports. There's nothing, no problem with that. But I am not going to let sports come between me and the Lord, between me and God's people. I really don't give a rip who wins. I began to analyze my own desires at one point in my life. I thought, here I am. I'm happier to be associated with a bunch of, you know, filthy, vile, most despicable human beings. Because they play the sport. And at the same time, I don't want to be around Christians. I can't imagine that would be right. And so I have to dissolve some of those ties. I don't want them to remain there. But when you've got unconfessed sin in your life, it keeps you tied to those people, to that world that's out there. I've dealt with over the years people that have addictions, mild addictions or strong addictions. I don't think they're any different. I think they're addictions. 
I've had people sit in my office and say, Preacher, you know, I just can't kick this alcohol and, and I'm just going to have to live with it. I'll tell you what it's going to do. It's going to keep you tied to the bar down there on the corner. It'll give you just a little bit of rope. It'll let you run for a week or two or three and then it'll yank you right back and you never get too far away. It keeps the ties there. You let sin lay in your life and it'll never set you free. It remain, retains the ties. I'll tell you what else it does. It reti- retains the ties to future sins. You know, sin never comes by itself. Did you ever tell a lie? No, you didn't. <laughs> you told two. Or three, or four, or five. Lies are like Lay's potato chips. Just can't eat one. You tell a lie, and you'll have to tell it again, or you'll have to tell another one to fix the one you just told. And they just keep, you ever, you understand? I keep lying in my life, and it just keeps claiming and claiming and going on and going. You can't get free. Sin never comes and never dwells alone in your heart. And if you keep those ties to sin in your life, you're linked with other sins that will come and take hold in your life as well. How can you turn them away when you've invited one into your life? They'll come in through the means of the other sin you dote upon that you allow to remain in your life. And they'll use that as an avenue. You say, what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying it's a danger not to deal with sins. You know, that future sin that's there, the ties are still there. If I don't break the ties, if I don't say this is wrong, this is wretched, and I'm not going to have it in my life, then before long it will come back with its cousin. And then it will come back with its uncle. And then before long there's a whole series of sins living in my life. As a matter of fact, that one sin will just lay there dormant. As long as you don't make him move out, he's happy. He just wants the upstairs bedroom in your life. And he'll just go there quietly for a while. And then he'll come down and make demands again and take control of your life. You know, the Bible says that we're to lay aside every weight and the sin that doth so easily beset us. I've had people ask me, what is that besetting sin? What sin is it that's so horrible? It isn't a sin. It's any sin you allow to lie in your life because eventually it will take control. And it will set you aside every time it wants to. That's what a besetting sin is. It's the one we justify. It's the one that we didn't push out. We can push all the rest of them as long as we leave that one in the upstairs bedroom there, the back corner of my mind. It's happy to dwell there. Because whenever it wants to, it makes its entrance. It makes its demands. And I'm powerless to turn against it. It's got me. It's got me. May I say to you, we need to deal with sin not only because it remains a barrier, not only because it retains ties, but because it removes our spiritual options. You know, when we're walking in fellowship with our Savior, we've got a lot of options in life that are removed when sin sets up its abode in our lives. All at once, my sin becomes something that I'm compelled to protect and defend. Imagine that. Imagine a murderer defending his murderous actions. What would you think of someone who stood in a courtroom and said, Well, you're right, Your Honor, I killed them all, killed them in cold blood, but you know what? I enjoyed doing it. I don't see anything wrong with it. What would you think about someone like that? And yet on a smaller scale, perhaps in your own life, we become guilty of defending the sins that once we prayed for God to deliver us from. And now we've become best friends and pals. Something to be protected and justified. It becomes a bartering chip if I'm not careful with God. I'll bet at one time in your life you've said, God, I'll stop that if... God, if you'll help me, I'll never do that again. You're trying to barter with God and you're using your sin to barter with a holy God. What a depraved people we are. 
your sin will become something that will remove your spiritual options. It's a sin that will all at once become the being that will help you cast the moat out of other people's eyes. The Lord talked about that. He said you try to find that little speck in somebody's eyes, that little tiny thing that's irritating their eyes. You say, here, let me help. And you don't even know you've got a beam in your eye. How do you get there? Well, you take a little sin and you hide it and you cover it up and you allow it in your life and you don't deal with it. And eventually you don't even realize it's there. So you can always help somebody with that little mode in their eye, even though there's a beam in yours. You've gotten so accustomed to it being there that it's just part of your life. What are you saying? I'm saying this. There's several things you can do with sin. And I've seen people do all of the following. Number one, you can kick yourself again and again and again and again and again and again and again. You can just, for the rest of your life, beat yourself and say, I can't believe, why in the world? I just can't, I hate that sin. I just don't. And I've seen people, they spend their whole life wasting their life beating themselves over their sins. Why in the world? Why can't I, what's wrong with me? I just can't. And on and kick yourself. Doesn't it make you feel good? Doesn't it solve the problem? No, it doesn't. It just makes you miserable. Or you can sit down and make promises to God in yourself. Or you count on me. I just never, never again, Lord. I'm, I'm done. I'm finished. I'm all free. I'm not. You know what the Bible said? You can't do that. The flesh lusts against the spirit. The spirit against the flesh. So that ye cannot do the things that you would. I got news for you. You can't live without sin in your life. You say, I just, I never heard a preacher say that before. Oh, I just quoted it out of the Bible. You're not going to live sinlessly. You say, why? Because life's about sin. That's the way the devil infected the world we live in. But you can just make promises. Oh, I'm going to do it this time, but never again. This is the last time. Have you ever said that about yourself? Oh, it's last bargaining again with self. Never again. Somebody said, well, I'm going to quit. How many times is that? Thirty-five? You say, well, you know, 35th time is, 36th time is charm. Can I tell you why? Because you failed 35 times. And one of these days, 45 times will be charm. Because we just make promises and promises. How many of you understand that's not a way to deal with your sin either? Some people just decide to hate everything. They just hate the sin and they hate the people that are involved with the sin and they hate everybody that judges them and they hate what the Bible says and they just get real hating. That's all they can do. I just don't want to come to church because all they ever do is just make me feel bad. I just don't want to be around those people. They make me feel bad. I just hate people that do that. I think, you know, people that just, they, they usually get upset with people that are involved in their own sin more than any other one. Hello? Boy, I'm just missing the amens tonight. They really comfort my heart and help me here. I can just spend the rest of my life hating everything. Well, that doesn't seem like that's going to help either. Or, and this is the popular one, I just kick back and forget it. Hey, case of Ron Sabron. I love Jesus. You love Jesus. I won't judge you. You don't judge me. Put on a little rock and roll music. Worship the Lord together. Won't condemn one another. All fit in together. Won't it be wonderful? No, it doesn't work either. Doesn't work either. You understand, I can't allow sin to remain in my life unconfessed, undealt with. It comes. I'm a sinner. Okay? I say it, and, and sometimes perhaps a little too comedic. I slam my door in the finger in the car door, and I think the same things you think, and, and we laugh and chuckle, but the truth of the matter is that's who I am. That's what I am. When I get frustrated, when it's supposed to open and it won't open, when it's supposed to close and it won't close, when I know I laid it there and I can't find it, I get frustrated and I sin. That's who I am, what I am. 
I'm not telling you tonight how not to sin. Because I haven't got that one figured out. The only way I could think of would be a 45 to the temple. Because as long as this flesh lives, it's going to desire and want and crave and demand. You may stand tonight and say, well, preacher, I'm not so bad. But so bad and bad are two different things. Nobody's going to stand tonight and say, I'm not bad. Because you are. At certain times and at certain places and under certain circumstances, we're a disaster. So my message tonight is not, don't sin. Now, it's certainly not sin. But I'm just telling you, I have no victory to offer you in the area of absolute holiness. Only God can do that. And one day He will, by the way. But I'm telling you tonight, don't let sin lay undealt with. I've had people call and they've said, Preacher, listen, I keep asking God to forgive me, and I feel I've been there a thousand times, a thousand times, and here I am asking God to forgive me for the same sin a thousand times. What should I do? About a thousand and one. About a thousand and two. Do you understand that to win the ball game, you only have to score one more run than the other team? Amen? I can understand the frustration of one to one, two to two, three to three, five to five, seven to seven, ten to ten. I can understand the frustration in a ball game like that. But it only takes you with one more. So if the sin keeps coming back and haunting you and you fight it and you argue against it and you put it down as we do, we want to live right. But it gets you for the thousandth time. And you fall on your face before God and say, God, I have been here 999 times and it got me again. Forgive me. I want that fellowship restored. Listen to me. And at that moment, you keel over dead. You won the game. You just get clean one more time than you get dirty. And you're clean, right? We ought to have a desire to stay clean. You say, how do you do that? Well, you can just never sin again. That's how you stay clean. Any of you mothers ever put your kids in their Sunday best clothes and tell them, don't you get dirty? Works, doesn't it? You learn to, you learn to realize or you come to realize at some point you just have to stay ahead of the game. Simply put, you get them dressed, and then when they get in the mud, you wash them off and you clean them up again. And then when they lose their shoe, you look and help them find it, you get it back on. And then when they get something in their hair, you take, and you take a washcloth and you clean it out. And then you, you, just, you have to stay one ahead. But if you're one ahead, they're clean. And let me tell you something, Christian. If you're one ahead, you're clean. And you say, well, you know, I I wish I could stop. So do I. And I've prayed God to help me not to fight or not to deal with that, not to to fight it as I ought and to deal with that and to put it aside. And he has given me some victories in my life. We ought to fight. And we ought to fight as those that want to gain a victory. And I have had some of those victories in my life. But as soon as one victory comes in one area, something else jumps up and hits me over the head. It's a continual contest with sin in general, not always just one spin, sin specifically. But I have learned over the course of a life that we just have to stay one ahead of the game. God, it's me again. Here I am. I need to, keep, I need to be cleaned up. Lord, I lost my shoe. I got in the dirt. I got something in my hair. I lost a button. I need you to fix me. And he does. And he does. 
You say, well, what does that do for you? I'll tell you what it does. It opens up that communication and drops those barriers. I can talk to my father anytime I want because I'm clean. And I'm ready to communicate. And he's ready to communicate. with. It keeps me close to the saints. It keeps me close to the saints because I realize that they're no better than I am. And we all fuss and fight with that thing. But you know what? We can get clean in an instant. And what a joy to be together with God's people knowing we can be clean. It takes away that guilty conscience. Because I know if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It loosens those ties. At some point, I've learned this. It may take a thousand. It may take two thousand trips to God. But at some point, I turn and say, look, I have had enough. I'm through. And I may have said it a thousand times before, but that time something changes. And I get a victory. And once I got a victory, I gained confidence. And once I gained confidence, when it comes back again, I say, hey, I beat you yesterday. Get out of here and leave me alone. And at some point, I can log that one off and say, you know what? I got, thank the Lord, I've got a victory there. Now, there'll be another one coming because they run like packs of wolves. But I got that one. I got that one. I'll tell you what it does when I get clean. It loosens the ties to the future sins because I don't have to worry about it becoming that besetting sin because I just always take care of it and keep it clean. It opens my spiritual options up. I don't have to waste my time defending my lifestyle. Hello? You know, there have been times when you've defended your lifestyle when you should have, if you were honest, said, you know, you're right. I shouldn't have been doing that. I was wrong. It was wicked. It was ungodly. And I want you to forgive me. Because God did. I asked Him to forgive me. But see, we've got to hide and cover up and pretend because we don't keep those things clean in our lives. I'll be honest with you. The best thing I can tell you to do with sin in your life is very quickly, as soon as it takes place, get it clean. Get it under the blood. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all unrighteousness. Get it under the blood. Lord, forgive me for that. Cleanse it. Wash it away. Make me clean. Keep me clean. And do it as soon as it happens. I've had people say, well, you know, I'm going to pray about that tonight before I go to bed. Boy, listen, then you're going to be dirty till midnight. I hope you don't need God between now and then. The best time to do it is as soon as it happens, steal away. Get along with God for a moment and say, God, I've got to take care of this now. I don't want this to be a problem between us. Fix it now, Lord. Cleanse it now. I want those avenues of communication open. Understand tonight, sin needs to be dealt with in the life of the believer. Not so that I can remain his son, but so that he can treat me like his son, as a loving father wants to treat his son. And the fellowship is the way it needs to be. Let's bow our heads just for a moment tonight. I'm not going to ask the pianist to come. We're not going to sing. But if you need to come, I invite you to do that. It's learning to deal with sin that gives us the victory. No one ever grows to the point where they never make mistakes. It's learning how to deal with mistakes. We are human beings, and as human beings, we still are frail and weak. and We still falter. And if I'm not careful, the temptation is just to forget about it and not deal with it at all. To somehow confront God with the attitude of, that's the way I am, I'm a sinner, and if you don't like it, then that's too, that's the wrong approach to take with the Heavenly Father. The right approach is, God, fix me. Clean me again. Not because I've been here a thousand times and I'm promising never to come again. God, I'll be here a thousand more times, truth be told. But God, I'm going to keep coming because I'm not going to let this sin build a barrier between me and you. And Lord, I want you to deliver me. And I want you to give me the victory. But Lord, I'm committed to staying clean. Even if I just stay one step ahead, it's my desire to meet you one day and realize that I was one up and won the battle. Let's tarry just for a moment tonight. A lot of folks here, if you'd like to come and join them, you certainly can do that. Don't let sin lay in your life. It'll fester, it'll putrefy, it'll eat away, it'll destroy everything that's good and right.
Get it taken care of. Get it taken care of. Our Father, we are here tonight because we need to be here. Lord, if we were perfect, we wouldn't need to come to church. If we were perfect, we wouldn't need to read your word. If we were perfect, we wouldn't have the problems that we have on a continuing basis. Lord, we're here tonight because we haven't figured it out. Sin still comes calling in our hearts and minds. And still bosses us around and pushes and pulls. And it's the bully that's always at work. And Lord, sometimes the problem is we just don't deal with it when it happens as we should. We've just become accustomed and we've added a room on and invited it to come and stay. Lord, I pray tonight you'd set our thinking straight that we would recognize Lord, we could never have gotten to heaven had it not been for what you did for us. Completely and totally. Lord, we couldn't contribute anything to our own salvation. We couldn't add or enhance anything. It took the cross to open the doors of heaven. And God, help us to realize that our battle with sin in this life is much the same way. We can resist for a time and we can fight as we ought and struggle as we should and sometimes gain a victory, but ultimately, Lord, we can do nothing unless you help us. Lord, sometimes the best we can do is come and say, forgive and cleanse. Lord, I'm so glad tonight that you've already promised that if we would confess our sins, that you would be faithful and just to forgive and cleanse. What a wonderful promise. And Lord, we realize one day when we stand in heaven, whatever victory there is in our life over sin, even if we only win by one, it's not us. It's you that wrought that work within us and gave us the ability to be clean because we can't even clean ourselves. You have to do that. So Lord, help us as we're engaged in this struggle. To recognize, Lord, that the battle goes on until the war ends. And one day when Jesus comes, the war will be over. But until that time, may we be on the front lines of this battle. And Father, may we continue to battle just to stay one ahead if that's the case. Lord, keep us clean. Keep us right. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you tonight. You are dismissed. Stay clean this week, one step at a time.